Thomas, huh? We hoped our warnings would keep you out of trouble. Guess this is it. that man. I know I didn't. I didn't hit anything. Now, Jerry, no hit and run charge has yet been made. The officer has just been saying he stopped you for speeding. Head officer. Well, sir, we've been watching this young man for some time. Committing little traffic offenses. You know, cutting in and out in traffic, shaving the red light, blocking crosswalks. Has he ever been arrested before? No, sir. He's been stopped and warned a couple of times. He seemed to take the warning seriously. But a few days later, that sort of behavior means just one thing to us. Sooner or later, the offender is going to hit real trouble. Your last statement may appear irrelevant, officer. However, it is the practice of this court, in the case of young first offenders, to deviate sometimes from formal procedures. We do this in the hope of preventing future offenses by finding causes. Now, officer, with this in mind, do you have anything further to say? Well, sir, I did see this boy a couple of months ago at a demonstration given by the high school driver education course. What happened there bears out what I've said about his bad driving attitude. The class was testing stopping distances and reaction times with the brake reaction detonator. Joan, you were going 30 miles an hour. This test shows that to get your foot on the brake after the first shot... Why, it took her 33 feet. So Joan's reaction time is just average. At 30 miles an hour, her car traveled 33 feet from the time she heard the first signal until her foot touched the brake. That represents just 3 quarters of a second, about average. I tried as hard as I could to stop, and it took all that distance. But I could stop at 10 feet. All right, Jerry, even though you wouldn't take the course, we'll let you try it at the same speed. Come on. At 30, hit the brake in about half a second. That means that Jerry's reaction time was better than average. But it still took about 92 feet for the car to stop. That's almost a third of a football field. So you see, there's no such thing as stopping a heavy, powerful car on a dime, no matter how fast your mind reacts. Boy, was that easy. Well, I was only taking my time. Bet I could do a lot better than that. <laughs> It was only a matter of time. That's all I have to say at present, Your Honor. Very well. It would appear that Jerry missed the whole idea of the demonstration. As the instructor pointed out, the power of an automobile must be controlled not merely by quick physical reflexes, but also by good judgment. Either one without the other is useless. 
Jerry apparently regarded his superior physical accomplishment as sufficient. He failed to match it with good judgment. Excuse me, uh, sir, but exactly what are the charges against my son? At the moment, Mr. Thomas, speeding and reckless driving. A charge of manslaughter may have to be made later, depending on the report of the accident investigation squad. I just can't understand it. I just can't believe he's like you say. But Jerry was always so good about the safety rules when he was a little boy. I can even remember that day when he brought the map he made in school showing the safest way home. He was so proud of it. He can't have changed that much. I'd like to think so, Mrs. Thomas, but he was only a little man with good walking habits. But Jerry seemed to keep that attitude while he was growing up. In fact, when he was 12 years old, he won a prize in a bike riding contest because he knew the rules so well. Jerry took no chances with his bike. I guess it was because his teacher and I had drilled it into him from the start to obey all the rules and to watch out for folks who don't. I used to keep telling him that there's always some motorist who's going to do some crazy fool thing. Yes, that's right. You started him out fine. But did you follow through with those ideas when Jerry began to drive? There's no doubt, Mr. Thomas, that Jerry's early training made him a good pedestrian and a good bicycle rider. But maybe he needed some more help, some special help, when he started to drive a car. That's when he started to borrow power, not his own. What is your name, young lady? Nancy. Nancy Tilford, sir. Yes, all right. And you were riding with Jerry when the arrest was made? Yes. Yes, I was. Now, suppose you tell us everything that happened from the time you started out this afternoon. Well, we... It was in front of my house where we started. Then Dick came along, just as Jerry was helping me into the car. And Jerry was helping you into the car? Oh, yes. He's always very polite about things like that. I see. Go on. Well, like I say, Jerry was helping me into the car when Dick came along. And we all decided to go down to Warner's for a mall. I ride with Jerry a lot, and I'm practically never scared. He really handles a car awfully well. Well, on the way, we stopped sort of close to another car at a red line, and the man said some awful things to Jerry. I get so embarrassed when those things happen. Some people can be the worst sports. Of course, Jerry says other people take advantage of you. And if you want to get anywhere, you just have to be first. When we got near Warner's, we did stop in a crosswalk because we were looking for a place to park, and Jerry didn't see the red light in time. I think it's terribly discourteous, but like Jerry says, people do it all the time. And then he did something so sweet that I just had to forgive him. He accidentally made a lady drop her bundles and helped her pick them up. She said there ought to be more boys like him. After that, we all went into Horner's. Some other kids we knew were in there and we talked for a while. It seems to me that Jerry is much more of a sportsman out of a car than in one. Why, Jerry's one of the best sportsmen in our school. What he did in the track meet this spring. You tell the judge about it, Dick. Well, okay. It was in the Centerville meet, a quarter mile run. We needed the points and Jerry had a chance to win it, or at least to place up in front.
He made a bad start and accidentally knocked down one of Centerville's men. He lost his chance because he went back to help the guy up. Even the coach said afterward that it was a great piece of sportsmanship. That kind of sportsmanship is a priceless thing, Jerry. It's something you can take with you wherever you go, even driving a car. Now, Nancy, what happened after you came out of the drugstore? Well, we started out for a ride. I remember we went around another car that was sort of wandering all over the street, like maybe the man was sick or drunk. I wasn't so much scared then. It was all under oak and hit that big bump. It was a curb. I ran over the curb. Jerry, was it the curb or was it a man? It was... I don't know. Yes? All right? Five minutes? Yes, thanks. Now, Jerry, I want you to know that a hit-and-run charge has not yet been made. It depends on the result of the investigation. I expect final word in a few minutes. But perhaps now, the caution and respect you had toward automobiles as a little boy is beginning to take on a new meaning. As a pedestrian, as a bicyclist, and as an athlete, you used your own power wisely. But when you borrowed the power of an automobile, you failed to see that it was not yours to do with as you pleased. It was only yours to control. Nearly everywhere we look, we see men controlling power. In many cases, human lives or valuable goods depend on how these men control and use that power. You have to remember that a powerful machine does not do its own thinking. You must do the reasoning for it. The driver of a bulldozer, for instance, can't afford to be reckless or to forget what he is doing even for a moment. And neither can you as the driver of an automobile. Sportsmanlike driving means that you drive with courtesy to others, that you observe all traffic laws that your car is always in control. Mom, she thought I was an okay guy. There's Dad. He had the right idea and I fumbled it. And Dick. Tried to make me look good to the judge. Nancy, she'll never want to ride with me after this. Me, I didn't drive that car, it drove me. I won't drive again. I'll never drive again. I'll never drive again. What you mean is you'll never drive again as you did today, Jerry. This report just handed me clears you of the possible manslaughter charge. Your car showed no evidence of having struck a person. The car that killed the pedestrian was the car you passed. It was found a few blocks from the scene. The driver was intoxicated. You must realize now what a dangerous situation you have been in because of your unsportsmanlike driving. The evidence given here today together with other evidence of the manner in which you were operating a car, makes you guilty of reckless operation. I hereby impose a fine of $25. In addition, I am recommending, in accordance with our traffic laws, that your driver's permit be suspended for a period of six months. Then, if you get your permit back, and if your parents allow you to use the car, well, the rest is up to you. This court is adjourned.
hundred horsepower in there. Borrowed, the judge called it. Nothing but warm water for a brain. Can't think for itself. That's where I come in, I guess. I've got six months to do some real thinking. Thinking I should have done before. From now on, when I borrow this power, I'll furnish the brain. That ought to make a good team. A good, safe team. Thank you.